you launched BioTrust in 2011. You did 100 million your first year. 11 years later, you sold to American Pacific Group for multi nine figures. What are the top three things that you would tell people to do to prep for sale? We did it the wrong way. We had to put in another four or five years of work to have the same exit we could have had four years in had we known like how to sell a company. We went to market and found out that we'd structured it wrong. If I was starting a company today, the first thing I would do. Josh Bazzoni, I'm so glad you came out to hang, man. Glad to be here, man. Yeah. Glad um, to be here. So quick bio on you. I know you from around Austin, but I think a lot of Austin entrepreneurs know you from BioTrust. Yeah. So you launched BioTrust in 2011. You did 100 million your first year. Correct. 11 years later, you sold to American Pacific Group or a sub of them for yeah. multi nine figures. Um, you've also invested in other brands that people know like Onnit and Magic Spoon, which is my favorite cereal. All right. Uh, and you're a pretty fucking good pickleball player. Yeah. <laughs> getting better, getting better. I know. <laughs> I, I remember when we first played and, uh, you've been on a ramp since then. Yeah. Just commitment to being good. <laughs> uh, it's traumatizing for me. Uh, so I want to talk about, uh, I want to get to BioTrust, but before we get there, how did you start in business and, uh, what was your kind of the beginning of entrepreneurship for you? Yeah. So I got a, a degree in biology in college. And then I went and worked for a guy named Bill Phillips in uh, Golden, Colorado. And Bill owned a company called EAS, mm -hmm. which at the time was like the biggest sports supplement company like in the world. They had like uh, Sylvester Stallone was a client and like Brad Pitt and Demi Moore and all these people. And the Denver uh, Broncos, when they were winning the Super Bowls in like 98 and 99, uh, they were clients of EAS. So I went from basically the farm in Iowa, you know, very rural area and went to Denver and like the first day I was in the gym there at EAS on the job, I think like Stallone was visiting crazy. And I'm like, what is going on? You know, this is crazy. <laughs> and so I was there for two or three years. Bill sold the company for a couple hundred million dollars on the first bite of the apple. And then he retained equity and then he sold again, I think made even more. Mm. So while I was there, I learned how to like build supplements, how to test supplements based on science, um, how to, you know, different parts of a company how to do marketing, really got into marketing there. And so I remember when Bill sold the company, I kind of like had a meeting with him and I was hoping that he would like fund my company because I was going to go out on my own. So he said, you have a lot of, you know, you're, you're a hard worker. You've got a lot of potential and you should go out there and start your own supplement company. And I'm like, yeah, I just don't have the money. And he's like, I didn't either. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, ah, shoot. <laughs> so yeah, that was, the, that was the beginning of it. And I started my first company when I was probably 23, 24 years old. Mm. And I'll, I remember the first month of the launch of the company. So at EAS, I made $48,000 a year. The first day I launched the company, my first supplement company, I made exactly $48,000 the first day. Wow. Because I had a big launch, you know, for the first day. And I'm like, holy sh sh I can like make what I made in a year in a day with this entrepreneur stuff. This is, this is pretty awesome. Damn. Those are pretty solid reference points to fuel you for the rest of the journey. Yeah. But yeah. two or three years working for a supplement company isn't a ton of time. Yeah. No, especially if you're 20. I mean, I, I understand the, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> hubris <laughs> involved in, uh, uh, that process. Um, is that the right word? Arrogance? Maybe, arrogance. maybe it's maybe the opposite arrogance. of hubris. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and thinking that you can go out and launch this stuff. Uh, I want to talk about kind of the, the, the differences that happen in supplements through that time, but how was EAS built? Like what was the marketing of that time? What did you learn there really from a marketing perspective? Because today, uh, direct to consumer supplements online is a very different thing than it was yeah. 15 years ago. So Bill was a direct response marketer, mm -hmm. but he was old school. He did it all with mail mm. and, you know, like postcards and mail and, lead generation ads and magazines. And so I learned all of that from like the greats, like Gary Halbert and, and, um, um, or Joe Polish, you know, I was working with Joe back in like 99 or 98. Oh, so that's where I learned the marketing from. So it was old school direct response, but the technology is the same or the, 
the psychology is the same, I should say. Mm -hmm. So how to get people to take action. A lot of online entrepreneurs these days, I think they miss the basic principles of psychology and selling and how to get people to actually take action and want your product. So that was, I mean, my first website was just a long sales letter. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, you can't make a website like this. This thing's like just scrolls forever. And I did it and it like worked like crazy because it's the same. It's just all about selling psychology, you know? Mm. So that's what I learned from Bill watching him market. He was a master. He was the first guy that came out with before and after contests. So like take a picture, take our products, follow our nutrition program and exercise program, do an after photo. And he was giving away like Lamborghinis to the winners and stuff mm. like that. So he had, the, <laughs> he's the first guy to have these huge contests where people would, you know, like millions of people would join around the country and compete for these, uh, you know, prizes and buy a lot of his supplements and change their lives. And so he was like the original godfather of that. Mm. Yeah. Um, so two or three years there, uh, you wanted to go off on your own. What was the first company? It's called GNS. It was global nutrition sciences. And I just kind of picked up where I'd left off with bill. I did like protein powders and like creatine products and fish oils and health, general health products and did some before and after contests all online. But my, my company came out in like, I mean, Google came out in 98. I think Google launched in 98. And then I was, I think 2001. Damn. <clears throat> Cause we were doing Google AdWords and stuff when it was just brand new. Yeah. And so we've got, as new technology would come out, new platforms to advertise, we would kind of be on the, the, beginning of that wave and so when you're on the beginning of that wave like google adwords you could just crush it with back in the day yeah. there's no competition big companies didn't know how to use it when facebook advertising came out no one knew how to use it and you could you could just compared to now your return on investment would be insane and we we did a lot of email marketing before can spam laws came out mm. so you could just <laughs> email whoever you wanted and people would like write us back and be so happy that they got an email you know, right. not like now where there's thousands, they get thousands of emails a day. Yeah. Then we'd get like tons of letters back with people's stories and stuff. And, and you could buy, we would spend, we'd get a 10 X return on email advertising. Damn. Back in the day. Damn. We'd invest 10,000 and make a hundred thousand from it. So, okay. So this is, I'm jumping ahead, but I don't fucking care. Uh, the, <laughs> the, that's a really good question in general with how, what you know now. So fast forward, are you 50 right now? Yeah. So fast forward. You, this is 30 years of business in the health, nutrition, supplement space. Um, you just pointed out in your first company, you basically grabbed the new trends, the new uh, marketing tools to mm. sell things. Is that something that you still feel like is a good play to aggressively go after the new platform, the new tool, or do you go after the tried and true? <clears throat> I think you got to test it all and see where it's at. But those people that can really optimize like a new technology, like, TikTok when it first came out. I know people that do really well, but it only lasts for a little while. You know, like Vital Protein sold their company for like six or seven hundred million dollars. And they were the guys who first went out on Instagram and did all the influencers. Mm. And they just crushed it doing that. But now you can't really do that. It's so much harder. There's so mm -hmm. much more competition. Once everyone else figures out the new technology and the new advertising platform, prices go up. It's harder to acquire customers, you know, at a decent price point. So I think you got you got to test it. You definitely got to test it. But for us, building our own email list was the way to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, we made so much revenue off of our own email list, uh, just because once you own it, it's yours. And we had 10 million plus people on an Damn. email list. So that's a great asset to have because whenever you need revenue to pay bills or whatever, you just send out an email. You know, yeah. there's a new sale and. It's like, that was the real valuable part of BioTrust was that we had this really large email list. And that was acquired over time <clears throat> or did you start with an email list? Over time. Trust? Yeah, over time. Um, okay, so first supplement company, GNS, um, where did that end? Where did you take it to and? Oh, I crashed and burned it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so all. So 48 grand the first day. <laughs> so 48 grand the first day, build it up to 30 million in revenue. Oh, damn. Then all supplements. Then 2010 hit. Um, the economy was crashing, big recession, 2010, the real estate market crashed. Um, a lot of the way we were doing business dried up. Uh, you know, I knew enough about business to be 
dangerous, and I, but I didn't know enough about, I was just stretched too thin, basically, is what happened. Then we had some legal problems in Colorado. Like my famous story I've talked about in other podcasts is I got, I got sued by Oprah one time. Oh. Uh, I love Oprah. I she's don't know a, this story. She's amazing. <laughs> so one day I'm walking into the office and a guy comes up and says, are you Josh Bazzoni? And I'm like, yeah. And he hands me, you know, he serves me a legal document. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh no, what's going on? And so I, I open it up and it's like, you're being sued by Oprah Winfrey for use of her image and likeness without her approval. Oh, damn. And I'm like, we're not doing this. You know, what's going on? And so what we find out is that one of our, we had thousands of affiliates. One of our affiliates was using her photos in the ads to drive clicks. And so this lawsuit was going on. And finally, I kept telling the lawyers, you know, I've donated a lot to Oprah's angel network, like her charity. Like, shouldn't we tell them this? And they're like, no, that's not how it works. You know, you can't, you can't do that. Yes, it is. <clears throat> so yeah, it's, that's how it works. It's definitely because, how it works. Because after like a year and all these legal fees, I said, screw you guys. Yeah. I'm going to like write a letter to our lawyers and say, this is, you know, I'm a big supporter of her. We, this was an accident. We didn't mean to do this. It was an affiliate. It wasn't us. I write the letter and they drop it within 48 hours. And I, you know what I mean? So the lawyers, I find oh. out lawyers aren't always at your best interest. They want to rack up the hours. And so, yeah. So, I mean, there are a couple lessons there. One is a hundred percent. You have to look at the incentives of the people that you're playing with. Yeah. And the incentives of an attorney are hourly billing. Yeah. Right. And, uh, in it's more complicated than that, but in dry, following incentive paths, I think is a good lesson in general. Mm. And the other is when somebody tells you that's not how it works, fuck them. Yes. <laughs> like, it, it, listen, you have to, it is your responsibility when somebody says that's not how it works to critically analyze the situation yeah. and they might know more than you and it might serve you to listen to them and dig into the process that typically happens and learn from it also. Yeah. So Joel and I, one of our great skill sets was really going against the grain and we would go in and people would say, Oh, you have to do all this branding and spend all this money on branding. And, and we just looked at everything and didn't care what the, the pros were telling us to do, we would just test things mm. and then see the results based on like real numbers, like for optimization of website pages. People were, were saying, you can't build pages that long with that much copy. No one's going to read all that stuff. And we'd be like, okay, let's do a short page versus a long page. And we test advertising dollars to the page. And then we would find out that the long page got like double the conversion rate. And so it's like that. And, and when, when people would always say, oh, you can't, you know, you can't do this in business. You can't, this is the proper way to do it. And the proper way will get you, you know, will drive you into bankruptcy. So we were always going against the grain, trying new things and just letting the, the stats show us like what really worked. I love that. I have this image of $30 million being lit on fire uh, mm -hmm. in my head. <laughs> so yeah, you want to tell me? Yeah. So tell me more that. about GNS. So <laughs> Oprah sues you, um, you point out, uh, tactfully to her attorneys that you donate a lot of money to her causes mm -hmm. and they drop the suit because people work with people that they like, know, and trust. Yeah. Um, and then you proceed to blow up a $30 million business. Yeah. Okay. So I was, you know, I was in my thirties at the time and, um, had maybe 80 employees and a big building and all this stuff in Denver. Things were, things were going well. Um, but with the Oprah thing, what happened was the state, she filed it in the state of New York. The state of New York attorney general then said, you know, why is Oprah also sued 50 companies, not just us. So she was doing it as a way to protect her brand, which I completely understand. Sure. And, uh, seems like you're also getting into FTC territory here. Yeah, no, we, that didn't happen. But the, the attorney general in, um, in New York then said, Oprah's filing this case in New York against 50 companies. <clears throat> we should be policing this too. They also, they just saw blood in the water. Yeah. You know, and so then they filed a suit against all 50 companies, including us. And then we were in Colorado and state of Colorado attorney general said, why is New York policing someone in, in Colorado? So they opened a suit against the company. Um, and I'm like 30, 30 some years old running a $30 million company. And I have a lawsuit against Oprah and it was Dr. Oz and Oprah and the same lawsuit <laughs> and then the state of New York and then the state of Colorado and like the legal fees and like how it just was a nightmare. Damn. And then the economy dropped some of our, the ways that we were advertising, like I think, um, Google AdWords had dropped off and it just was a mess. And so <clears throat> 
you know, at the end of it, it just, we didn't go bankrupt, but at the end of it, it was just like, it was such a mess because of all this legal stuff that we ended up just shutting down. But the great thing was I was 37 years old. I remember now I was 37 and I had all the knowledge and I also mm. just learned what not to do, mm. you know? So a lot of being a great businessman is learning the hard way of what not to do. And so then I moved to Austin to start all over. And I met my business partner, Joel Marion. I had a conference here and Tim Ferriss spoke at the conference mm. and Bill Phillips, my old mentor spoke at the conference. Before you tell me that, yeah. I want to know something about the, uh, about GNS, the $30 million company that was going very well pre lawsuit. Yeah. Um, easy pay to rack has tons of supplement companies that use us for payments. Yeah. Um, we did some of BioTrust for some period of time mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, what I know about supplement companies is there are a litany of different ways to structure them, uh, both from like, are you making the product? Are you outsourcing it? Are you warehousing the product? Or are you outsourcing it? Are you shipping yeah. it? Are you outsourcing it? Um, are you, you know, where, where's the traffic coming from? Is it, uh, you know, pay per click? Is it SEO? Is it affiliates, et cetera? All of which changes the margin. And I see a lot of supplement companies that redline. So they operate off basically zero margin mm. and they grow and they get to 10, 15, 20 million with no margin. Mm. Um, and a lot of them explode yeah. because they have no margin. What were you, what kind of operation were you running with GNS from a margin perspective? And like generally, how did it lead to that margin? I think we were running at like at that time, maybe 15, 16, 17% net profit. So there's good margins in supplements. Mm -hmm that's where we were. And a lot of companies, like you said, nowadays <clears throat> we invest in some of them, but they're just trying to get gross revenue, right? Because food companies, for example, we invested in a, in a lot of uh, better for you food products. They just get a three, four, five, six times multiple off revenue, not profits when they buy, when they, when they sell. Right. So the company trying to sell to the company buying is buying something off of multiple of so like revenue. primal kitchen, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the mayonnaise with the avocado mayonnaise and all that Mark Sisson owned that company. Mm -hmm. My now, I, I believe my numbers could be wrong, but I believe they got to 50 million in revenue and then they sold to 200 million to craft. Okay. So it's four times the revenue, mm -hmm. but I don't even think they were profitable at all. See the play is just to get as much revenue and shelf space as possible and then sell for a large multiple. In the supplement world, for us anyway, it was all about net profits. And so they give you a multiple off of net profits, mm. which is much lower than off gross revenue. Yeah. So when you go to sell, you actually have to have decent profit margins in order to like get a good exit. So, you know, for us, I can't say the exact amount, but supplement companies, at least at that time, were getting like eight to 12 times net profits. Got it. Okay. Off their net profits. But so back to the original question, back at uh, my first company. Which would, so 15%, that would, at 30 million, that would put the sale around 30 million. Yeah. Not quite, but. Yeah, but I, I'd never sold that company. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. No. And, and, that, and the big thing there is, the big news there for me was, looking back, is that I got financially crushed at age 37. I mean, I had to sell my house, car, everything. Ouch. I had to move from like a mansion in Denver to like Austin and I lived in an apartment and to start all over at like 37, 38 years old. And then I hit the thing that was the real big thing, which was BioTrust. So there's a lot of people out there here that are, you know, they're getting close to 40 or early 40s and they just think their time's completely passed. You know, they think all every, which is so funny because when I was young, no one in their 20s or 30s was like running legitimate companies. Right. It was all these older, white-haired CEOs. I would go into banks and try to borrow money, and they would just laugh me out of the bank. Right. And now if you're 40, the business world's changed because all the tech entrepreneurs are in their 30s, you know, yep. making it big. Well, yes, specifically VC-backed ones are, though uh, I will say kind of back to the, the point that we're circ uh, I, I've been circling around here is that uh, – very often the newer entrepreneurs aren't thinking about the exit. Yeah. They don't know their history. And as a result, that, that's why we see the companies that are running. It's not that are running at no margin supplement companies. It's not because they're aiming for an exit and they know that it's off of gross. Mm. Most of them, it's an ego play and they're just, Hey, look at my numbers. Hey, I did a million a month last month. Yeah. I did 2 million a month last month. Yeah. 
and they're flexing and they have no margin. It's a recipe for disaster. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, but no question about it. Like the landscape is totally different mm. than it used to be. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So that, that burned, you moved to Austin. You, did you know Joel previously? No. So I had a conference here at Lake Travis, Tim Ferriss spoke, Tim and I've been friends for, for years. And then that's where I met Joel and all these affiliates. Cause my goal was to get out of supplements and get into publishing online publishing because Joel was doing 10 million a year <clears throat> in revenue selling his own ebooks and the margins are insane for ebooks sure you're, it's like software you're just selling air yeah because it's all downloadable right programs on health and fitness so i met joel at that conference and then i met like 20 more versions of joel with different affiliates and i found out they all had these big monster email lists and they all sold health content about all kinds of how to get in shape and how to eat right nutrition how to work out and i'm like um who's doing your backend supplements for all these companies? And they're all like, they were just scattered. And I thought, wow, I could start a supplement company for the, for the ebook publishing business and then become their backend provider for like high quality supplements for like all these millions of clients that they have. So at the conference, I met like Mike Geary, um, Joel, like, you know, all these guys that were kind of number one for for uh, email marketing of, of content. Mm -hmm. And over time, Joel and I, then I had to pitch Joel on this whole idea of starting Biotrust. And I pitched Joel, I have this big presentation and he goes, nah. He goes, <laughs> I'm doing 10 million a year selling air right now with like one employee. He's like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna do this. <laughs> and so then I'm like, ah, oh, man, I really wanted Joel on the team. And then I said, well, let's test a few supplements out there to our list and see how it does. And so Joel tested some product out there to his big email list and it like crushed the numbers. And so then Joel's like, I think, I think we need to do a supplement company. Mm. And so we ended up doing a supplement company and how we did hundred million in the first year was because we had the Mike Geary's and Joel and all these people that had these big email lists. And we did a deal with all of them that basically said, um, we'll be your backend supplement company send our offers to your email list. And, and Mike would say like, I love their protein powder. Here's why it has no artificial colors or flavors. It's grass fed, you know, whey protein, all this stuff. And <clears throat> we'll give you 30% of revenue or 30% of revenue created, but then we'll also give you a piece of the back end. So every time a customer buys again, you'll get paid again. So it was an affiliate program, but not off a of first sale. It was off of like lifetime sales of the customer. Mm. So, Everyone loved that idea. We signed up probably 30, 40, 50 of the biggest email marketers in the country and became their backend supplement company. And that's how basically how we did hundred million in the first year in revenue. Cause the first product we launched was a protein powder. And I think it did like two, three, four million dollars in the first week of launch. And Joel and I looked at each other and we're like, you know, this is going to be, this is going to be huge. I'd pitched yeah. Joel that we could probably do 5 million a year in revenue on a supplement company. <laughs> we did 4 million in the first week of launch. That's insane. Beyond a million is brought to you by easy pay direct. If you're an entrepreneur and you are still using a product like Stripe or PayPal to accept payments, it is time to find out why the largest names in your industry would never consider doing that. Check out easypaydirect.com forward slash B A M to find out more. Uh, so, I mean, a couple things stuck out to me there. One is, um, one is the sort of perpetual sale. So Joel says no, and you're like, yeah. Hey, how about, how about we just test it? Yeah. And I think that that's a really good lesson in general for people mm. is no, doesn't mean no in all situations. <laughs> uh, the other is, you know, leveraging this massive affiliate network, but creating an offer for them that was better than the other offers. Mm. And it sounds like, and I'm inferring this, so correct me if it wasn't the case, but it sounds like at the time, the norm was not to give part of the continuity, the recurring subscription. True. Yeah. So most affiliates would, uh, the people with these huge email lists would promote a product, but they would expect 30 or 50% on the first sale. Mm -hmm. And then any, anybody that was in a subscription, sorry, so sad for the affiliate. Yeah. And so you offered this subscription upfront or revenue from it. Yeah. Um, did it occur to you at that point, uh, to white label the product for other people, or did you ever go down that path? 
No, because we wanted to keep the brand mm -hmm. all us because we were looking for an eventual exit. Mm. So if you white label, you're just competing against yourself and your own brand. And so everything was, everything was BioTrust. Got it. So yeah. from the beginning, the goal was to sell it. Yeah, from the very beginning. Um, jumping ahead again. So 100 million the first year, uh, and then you continued to do 100, mil 100 million roughly every year for the 11. Yeah. Right? Why did you not sell sooner? Well, if in retrospect, we shouldn't have done 100 million in the first year. Mm. <clears throat> to show growth? To show growth. So that's the, like a... That's like the inexperience of someone who's never sold a company before. We didn't understand how certain things affect the sale of a company. For example, we just thought it was all about revenue. We didn't understand that your product category that you're in affects the multiple you get for the company. So if you sold $100 million worth of like a food product or a protein powder or collagen powder product, you could command really high multiple. But if you're doing anything in weight loss, it's like, it almost is a negative against you. So why they don't like weight loss companies when you need to go to exit in general, why not? there's a history of weight loss companies like crashing and burning hmm. through, through acquisition, because what happens with a lot of weight loss companies is they're hot for three, four, five years. And then they bomb like Atkins trendy, they're trendy. Got it. And so, you know, slim fast and, and Atkins, there's always every three, four years, there's a whole new rotation of a new diet that comes in, hmm. you know? So that makes sense. Yeah. So, we were, we grew too fast. We should have done like 20 million the first year. It would have helped also from an operational standpoint <laughs> because what? we had a tiger by the no tail. Shit. <laughs> like you can't imagine what we went through to do a hundred million in the first year. I mean, we had like five employees when it started Jesus. and I we're like working. We're not, we're never not working. Joel and I had a standing call at 2 AM every day because we were still working at 2 AM. And so after our call, I think I would go to bed at like 3 a.m. And then I think I'd get up at like 6 a.m. And then it was insanity, right? So we're trying to work with manufacturers to get enough product created to keep up with the demand. We're trying to work with payment processing to cover that type of thing as a new company, that type of growth. We're trying to rapidly hire because we know where this is going and we have to build a real team that can manage all of this. So it's like five years of work, six, seven years of work into like one year. Yeah. Yeah. Insanity. So, yeah, I, I, I th I've thought about that particular element of your story um, several times. Um, and, and we haven't had a chance to talk about it because zero to 100 million is an insane thing. But it's different if it's a VC backed company that has a plan to do it. Yeah. And it's not a surprise, right? It's like, okay, well, we deployed X capital with the intention of why return. And so we staffed accordingly to do this. You know, we've done this marketing model before, yeah. right? They're running a playbook. You guys are like, fuck it. Let's get a bunch of affiliates <laughs> to promote this supplement. <laughs> let's and go. rock and roll. Yeah. yeah. So what was the makeup? And I think, I think I'm gonna know some of this, but to, today, for anybody that doesn't know supplements, today you can white label a product that's basically a business in a box. Yeah. You can have somebody that will put your brand on sort of a generic, uh, supplement and a whole, di whole range of different types of supplements, um, protein powders, pills, whatever, they will warehouse it for you. They will drop ship it for you direct to the consumer. All you need to do is send them an API call or an email saying, send this product to this place. Yeah. And that can be your supplement company. I'm guessing that's not what you did. Not at all. And that wasn't available in 2011 either. I yeah. don't think, um, Tell me about sort of the creation of the product, the warehousing of the product, the shipping, the tech, like how did you put that together and what was there before you did the email launch and what wasn't? Oh my gosh. Um, how we, first of all, the products are really good because I'd been in the industry and understood from EAS that you have to have like science backed products that are, that are, all the ingredients are tested. We did everything all natural. Like these are really good products. We didn't just, you know, white label them from another company. So we had a, a great guy named Sean Wells and Sean was our chief science officer and he came in and like designed these, the best products. And so we had, before we even launched BioTrust, we probably had a year of product development, maybe even longer. So before we even launched our first sale, we had a whole year of product development, finding manufacturers, getting the products built. 
Okay, well, yeah. we've established that you didn't have any money. <laughs> so did Joel put this bill or how did this work? Here's the crazy, the craziest part of this whole thing. So at the end of the, my whole journey in Colorado, yeah. I was, long story, but I was left with $600,000 to my name after selling my houses and everything. Got it. I had 600,000. And then Joel and I launched an ebook on health and fitness that I wrote. Mm-hmm. And that ebook, we did a launch around it and it was a $3 million launch. Damn. So Joel and the profits from that were, you know, maybe we, we netted half of that mm-hmm. one five and then we paid for product or, what, or whatever. So maybe Joel and I made 500 grand from that. Mm-hmm. So I put in 500 grand from the ebook launch. Joel put in 500 grand. So and, 3 million, you paid affiliates half of it to mm-hmm. sell the ebook. So now you're down to one five. You had some cost to make costs it. Costs and everything else. Mm-hmm. And you know, it, it came out to about 500K each. Got it. I just, I, I like breaking those down because so often you hear the story of the number. But you don't. You yeah. never hear what people take. Here's, yeah, here's the part of it. So I have a friend that's company sold for $800 million and he's all over the news and sold $800 million and everything. And then he's talking to me privately and he's like, I own 1% of the company. Damn. <laughs> wow. So he's not making $800 million, you know? No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so with, with Joel and I, we both put in 500,000 and from that 500,000, we never took out a loan after that and we never had any investors. So when we sold the company for nine figures, like we owned 90% of the company and then like 10% to our employees. Mm. So it's a, it's a completely different thing. Did you have uh, another random question, but did you have a sort of stock option pool or equity pool for the employees through the journey or did you just break off 10% at the end? No, there was, there was a stock option for the 10% for employees. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. So you went through all of the formulation process, the scientific testing uh, to make sure you had a good product in the beginning. You knew what you were selling. Uh, did you warehouse it? Did you have a giant warehouse with a whole bunch of fucking product waiting to sell? We had our COO at the time, uh-huh. chief operating officer, owned a shipping company in Denver. And so we uh, shipped out of that company. But we, we outsourced manufacturing. We outsourced shipping. Uh, we had customer service in-house just so we could control it. It would be really high quality. And we outsourced accounting in the beginning. But over time, you know, we brought a lot of things in house, but we never did shipping and we never did manufacturing for supplements. It doesn't make any sense to manufacture supplements. You know, it's like warehouses of high tech equipment and it just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So you just create your recipes and there's manufacturers around the country who will create that recipe for you. And, but then they ship to your warehouse warehouse. Yeah. And then we shipped out around the country. Got it. So it, functionally you sort of drop ship from one of your employees businesses. Yeah. And then we had different warehouses over time because just the, with logistics at that volume, having, you know, an East coast, West coast warehouse makes a lot more sense and you know, it got more complicated, but that's yeah. how we started. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, I mean, this it may be moot at this point, but 2011, what did you do from a tech perspective? Oh my gosh. Most, we didn't, there's no Shopify's out right. there to any degree. Everything was in-house custom built. Right. And it was a, it was a nightmare. Yeah. Tech back in those days was hard. Cause it just, it wasn't like today with Shopify and things integrated and apps and all that. Yeah. Yeah. It was old school. Our affiliate software that kept track of sales to affiliates was like homegrown. We, you know, click funnels. Yeah, right? sure. Um, click funnels. Is basically the first versions of ClickFunnels was basically like our tech, not the Russell. It was just the same model, like sell on a page and have upsells and the tech that was there. So I always joke with Russell. I'm like, I got in the wrong business because, you know, his, <laughs> his company ClickFunnels is probably worth, you know, multi-billion at this point or close to that. And we're in supplements, but it was basically like the same thing that we had custom home home built. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's fighting a battle now. They're definitely competitors. Yeah. Yeah. Pushing, stealing their, their market share. Oh, sure. Yeah. He, he might've lost his window to go for the highest price that he mm. got at one point, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's, uh, that sounds like a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you, uh, when we sat down, you said you did a billion over the course of about a billion over the course of those 11 years. Yeah. Joel and I together with everything we've done together is about a billion in, in revenue over 12 years. Um, so 
was the marketing model the same for BioTrust the whole time? Was it always the email, leveraging other people's email lists? Um, how did that expand? So you launched with this giant $100 million a year with other people's lists. Um, how did the marketing change as you grew? So the affiliate model worked well for four or five years. And um, then we tried to go to market to sell. And that's a, another story. And we found out we weren't ready to sell. Um, we didn't know, like anyone out there who wants to sell a company, my best advice is to learn what the buyers want early in the process so you can build the company that way. For example, going to 100 million in revenue and then going up to like 110, 120, 130 over time is not what they want to see. They want to see 20 million the first year and then 30 million and then 50 million and then 90 million. And you have these, this growth rate that looks really impressive, right? And they want to see diversification from when you're advertised at. So like one of our initial companies we um, marketed or we invested in is on it with, you know, Joe Rogan was an owner of on it along sure. with uh, Aubrey Marcus. Mm -hmm. And originally on it, the Joe Rogan podcast was a huge percentage of revenue. And so when on looking to sell the meaning that on it was sponsoring the Joe Rogan <clears throat> podcast in the early days, meaning that Joe Rogan owned a big part of the company. Yep. And he was driving a lot of revenue for the company. So when they go to sell people who buy the, buy the company, which you ended up being Unilever, they want to see diversification in the sales channels. So if Joe Rogan got hit by a bus, mm -hmm. they're not out of business. So we didn't know that early on either. So you want to have diversification so that when you lose one of your channels, your marketing channels, other ones can pick it up. So there's all kinds of things like that. When you go to sell a company that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. We also didn't realize they didn't, people didn't want the weight loss category at all. And it was a detriment to selling the company. So the first time with four years, we tried to sell the company. Um, we went to market and just found out basically that we weren't ready to sell the company. So then we had to go back, kind of remodel the whole company at, in a way that's built to actually sell. And then, you know, 10, 11 years later, we were finally able to sell the company. That's an awesome lesson. Uh, most people do not premeditate the sale unless mm -hmm. they're venture backed or they came from yeah. Silicon Valley, yeah. which is their whole game, right? Yeah. Speed to exit. What are the top three things that you would tell people to do to prep for sale? One, get a real team in place that can replace you when you sell. A lot of guys are founders, they're CEOs, they want to control everything. They sell a company and then when they sell, they get put like golden handcuffs on them. And they have to work for the company and become an employee for like four or five years, mm. which is torture if you're an entrepreneur and a founder. I see it happen a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what we did was we we replaced ourselves this before we sold for a number of years. And then when part of the deal was when we left, we left. We were completely out of the company when we sold. So that's a big one. The other one is grow you know, to grow 20, 30% a year, show like steady growth. That's what they want to see. They don't want to see a hundred million and then you kind of level off. Mm -hmm. That's not a good thing. The other is make sure your product category is the best it can be. It's better to sell 50 million of powdered collagen than a hundred million of a weight loss product just because the category. So we didn't realize that each category has a different multiple. And so, and that happens with any company. So any company you happen to, to be in, a lot of times people just go to products that are hot and they want to sell, even in like finance or whatever. Mm -hmm. And when they get into it, they might realize that when they go to exit, they, they chose the wrong product category. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one of the big explosions of our lifetime was WeWork. And part mm -hmm. of that was that he raised money through the lens of them being a software company. Yeah. Which of course they weren't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that led to a bizarre multiple that was really inflated mm. and not based on the actual value of the company. Yeah. Um, uh, and, but the, I, I think the the takeaway from that really is that, you know, if you have a way to modify your offering into a model that has a bigger multiple, when you're looking at exit, take it. Yeah. So I would, if I was starting a company today, the first thing I would do is I would go and find out who would buy a company like that. And I would talk to those people 
and I would talk to um, bankers that sell those types of companies. And I would right from the beginning say, what are they looking for? What product categories, what growth rates, like what, you know, what structure of the company. And so from the very beginning, I would find out what the buyer wants mm. when I was, when I was starting a company, we did it the wrong way. We, we were four or five years in, we thought we had a home run and then we went to market and found out that we'd, we'd structured it wrong and made, made pivotal decisions that just didn't serve us. Mm. So, and it, people, a lot of people get into entrepreneurship and they don't think they'll ever exit. And I tell all entrepreneurs, I'm like, oh, this company will be sold. It might be when you die, uh, it might, your kids might sell it, but from the beginning, you need to like structure the company as if you're going to sell it. Cause it will be sold at some time. Mm. A lot of people say, oh, I never want to sell. I'm not, I'm never going to sell. I'm like, what's going to happen when you die? Well, I guess it'll be sold. Yeah. Everyone's selling a company. They just don't realize it. Yeah. That's a good point. I also think that it's foolish to believe that you will know what your future self wants. Mm -hmm. And so to not organize things in a way for exit is putting yourself in a bad situation in the future. Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's like a house. So I have friends who have these great houses and they start to get run down and then they don't, they're not actively taking care of the house. Right. So after like five, six years, you go into their once beautiful house and like the hot tub doesn't work anymore and the lights don't work. And this is, this is broken. And then they live that way for years and then they go to sell the house and they have to do all this remodeling and fixing all this stuff. And they have this beautiful house before they go to sell it. Right. But it's like, they should have enjoyed the house the whole time. Yeah. So I, I say anyone who's starting a company, build it to sell from the very beginning and then maintain it. So if your life changes and you do want to sell it, you have something that's sellable like right away. Yeah. 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 That's great. Uh, you mentioned getting advice from bankers. Mm -hmm. Where do you find those bankers? Um, you do a search and find bankers that are selling your types of companies. So there's specific niche bankers, like in supplements and, um, and there's specific in all categories. So I would just start with a Google search and just learn the top ones and do a meeting, do a meeting with them and say, I'm starting this company. We'd eventually like to exit. Can I have some of your time? And most of them will give you some time. And if you've even started and you're a year in, most of those guys will want to talk to you because you could be an eventual exit for them. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay. So I met you years ago while you were in BioTrust doing the thing. Uh, and every time I saw you, it was most of our interactions were around a new business that you were investing in or that yeah. spun up and we were doing the payments for it. Um, or it was related to BioTrust and then you sold it. Mm -hmm. And now the only time I see you is when we're playing pickleball. <laughs> uh, t tell me about, you know, selling for uh, nine figures plus and how that impacted your life and what was different than expected. So a lot of entrepreneurs don't make really any money, but a basic salary and then they exit and then they get a windfall of, of cash, right? Mm -hmm. And their life dramatically changes. So BioTrust is doing 15, 20% you know, um, net profits a year at a hundred million plus. So Joel and I were doing really well. Yeah. 10 million plus a year, you know, take home. Yeah. You know, in some years way more than that. Pre-tax. Pre yeah. Pre-tax. Yeah. And, um, that's an amazing lifestyle. So yeah. we had the monetary things that we wanted. Um, and then we sell the company and <clears throat> I just remember sitting at my computer after all this work and all this, this big, long exit process and due diligence process and multiple companies wanted to buy us and, and all the negotiations and all the contracts and legal stuff and all of this, and I'm sitting at my house on the computer and I'm talking to Joel on the phone. We're waiting for the wires to come in. Cause that's like what I've been waiting for my entire life. It's like winning the Super Bowl of business. You know what, what, how many businesses go out of business, right? Like 90 some percent of businesses go out of business. And then the percentage of companies that actually end up selling is probably like 1% or less of all companies that ever start. It's probably 0.5% or less. So Joel and I are sitting there and I'm looking at my screen and the wire comes through to my account and I'm on the phone with Joel. I'm like, holy shit. And he's like, yeah, holy shit. And then we just sat there looking at the screen for like two minutes. I'm like, good job, man. And he's like, good job. And we hung up, right? And I thought that that would be a day where all my problems disappeared, like the heavens parted, like there was a parade for me and I, I'd won, you know, 
all, like all my insecurities would, would go away. My relationships would be perfect. I always thought that once I hit this number, life was golden and I was set. And that number hit and it was kind of an empty feeling. Mm. It was awesome and great, but it wasn't what I expected. And so after we sold the company and we were just out, I was completely in shock because I was like a workaholic. I had, I was in a nutrition company selling health products, but I was so overworked and stressed out that I was like overweight and wasn't healthy. And so I had to like look in the mirror and basically say, okay, the financial parts taken care of. I don't have to work another day in my life, but I've got a lot to fix. Like I've got to like get in shape again. I've got to recalibrate you know, my like workaholism and put it into something else. I've got to like dig into the old trauma stuff that I've been running from forever from childhood, for example, and like really dive in and do some work around that because I'm just, I'm like, I've got this money now, but I'm not like truly a happy, fulfilled person. So that's kind of what happened. And it was a huge wake up call after the exit. It's like, it didn't really change our life that much because we'd already, you know, done well financially during the process. So there was nothing else I really wanted. Yeah. And so then it became like an internal, an internal crisis, so to speak. After yeah. That. And you've, I mean, you've painted this picture, but to highlight it, um, you know, if you're at post tax, uh, making five to 7 million a year, um, most entrepreneurs, when they sell, that's what they leave with. Yeah. You know, like your friend that had, that had an $800 million sale, but owned 1%. You know, he's got 8 million and then he's losing half of that to tax right away. Yeah. So he's coming home with four with his exit. Yeah. Well, he's got, well, the great thing about selling a company is you pay capital gains. Oh, right, right, So right. you pay 20, 21, 20, right 22%. Yeah. Instead of the usual 40 something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we had calculated S by still. the- Yeah, still. <laughs> we, we calculated that we would have had to sell, we would have had to hold on to BioTrust and do the same revenue for like 25 years in order to make what we did off selling the company. Ah. Because of the tax differences and everything yeah. like that. Okay. Um, nonetheless, you, you, you've been uh, pulling a good amount off the table for a long time. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that that's really relevant because there are, and that's, that's frequently the difference between the, when you say most people, um, most entrepreneurs take a salary and then their payoff is at the end. Mm. That's usually the biggest difference between a VC backed or a funded company and a bootstrap company mm -hmm. is that the bootstrap people have the capacity to take home um, little windfalls every year yeah. and the VC back people usually don't, yeah. right? They're usually on salary as a CEO. Um, so tell me about one of the things that I heard you say, I, I in prep for this, uh, watched, um, parts of a podcast you did with our friend, Ryan Moran. Yeah. And in it, you said you're more proud of the change that you've made in the last year than of building a hundred million dollar company. Yeah. To you, what is the difference between creating physical change and emotional change in your body versus creating change in a company? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I, I am really proud of what we did at BioTrust. Uh, we employed hundreds of people, affected hundreds of families. Um, we had millions of customers that we gave like top quality products to. A lot of them used it to change their lives. We did a lot of charity work, Make-A-Wish Foundation, we did millions and millions of dollars to make a wish, like hundreds and hundreds of, um, of wishes granted. We fed kids through no, no kid hungry. We did millions of meals. We, we tied in a lot of charitable aspects, aspects to the company mm -hmm. that was all super fulfilling, but at, on a personal level, like me making a lot of money is nothing compared to like over the last year or so, just the changes I've made internally, like just coming. If you, you can have all the money in the world, but inside you're full of anxiety and depression and you're full of um, angst and you don't have solid relationships or you don't have real authentic relationships. And I mean, what do you really have? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that stuff is so important. So over the, I, after I sold the company, <clears throat> I did like a big mushroom journey. <laughs> I did a, a how big? like five grams plus ish big okay. <laughs> and, uh, with sassafras with, with the shaman and, um, just a lot of stuff that I was running from. And sassafras is like, it's MDA it, MDMA. I mean, it's kind of like MDMA, but yeah, yeah I think it's, it's a similar molecule. Yeah. Yeah. It's similar to MDMA. Yeah. And so I've done quite a few psychedelics in the past, but this is one where I really went in with the attention of like, 
let's just face the stuff I haven't faced, the old stuff in there that's holding me back. And a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs I know say, I don't want to like deal with the trauma of my past because I'm afraid it'll take away the edge. Because, mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're crazy because the edge is what's like holding you back and like keeping you up at night and it's suffering. So did a big mushroom journey, had a lot of realizations. And um, I also met Mike Tyson, which I talked about in Ryan's podcast. Oh, and I, I didn't hear that part. Yeah. <laughs> While you're I, on mushrooms? Well, no, <laughs> that'd be awesome <laughs> to do mushrooms with Mike I Tyson. I wasn't sure if this was like, you saw me, him. Me, and Mike you're... Tyson and Oprah were doing mushrooms right, together. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I met Mike Tyson at an event and I talked to him. And uh, I'm like, this, there was a line, take pictures with Mike Tyson, right? And I'm sitting there going, how can I get more time with Mike in this big line of people waiting to take pictures with Mike? I'm like, oh, I saw him do a podcast with Tony Robbins talking about doing Bufo, 5-MeO-DMT, which is a psychedelic. So I'm like, and he was pumped up about it with Tony Robbins, said that it, it changed his whole life. Uh, Tyson, like in the Hangover movies, was like 300 and some pounds. You know, he was psychotic at times. He was in prison. He was like, the, the, chan the, the chance of that guy being alive right now, he blew yeah. through $200 million. I mean, he was <laughs> out of control. Tyson's out of control. Mm. Bankrupt himself, after, lost all that money, blew it all. And uh, I see him and on these podcasts and stuff, he's like a wise guy now. He's very wise. Yeah. And he's in great shape. He seems that way. He's supposed to be fighting again. Mm -hmm. a and he's 58, I think. And so I talked to him about uh, psychedelics and Bufo. He said it completely changed his life. He said it just rewired his whole system. And he talked to me while all these people are waiting in line. He talked to me for like 10 minutes. Yeah, love and, and I say to Tyson, I go, you know, I met you before. And I go, you were at the Hard Rock Hotel in Vegas. And it was at the prime when Tyson like just got out of jail. And he was like built like a truck. And he was just angry at the world. And I walked up to him at the Hard Rock Cafe. And he was walking through with like a, a couple big bodyguards or something. And I go, hey, Mike. And he looked at, and he looked at me like he was going to kill me. Like <laughs> I was scared. I go, hey, Mike. He looked at me. I go, sorry. And I walked away because I'm like, this guy is having a bad day. And he's going to like. And, and then I meet Mike at 58. And he's like jovial and wise, like a, an old sage, and he's in great shape. And so I talked to him about it. And he said, you know, this 5-MeO DMT changed his life. Well, for me, I had that in my head that if Mike Tyson could go from 300 pounds back to like mm. 215 and completely change his life as this wild guy who had no, you know, who was just insane and losing all this money, surely I can make some real changes in my life hmm. in like a year. And so for me, I went from um, like 215 pounds of my max down to like 165, like changing everything. Yeah. I did like a lot of psychedelic work. I did therapy. I like dove into the stuff from childhood, which we all have that was haunting me. I dealt into my abandonment wounds. I dealt, I dove into like all this stuff that I'd never wanted to face before. Cause I didn't think it was important. I'm like, I'm making all this money. I'm doing great you know, nothing's holding me back. Cause I thought money and finances were the, the key to everything. Right now I realize that it's like your, your relationship with yourself, like being able to sleep at night, like having great friendships that are authentic with friends, like, uh, having a real romantic relationship where you're, you're truly yourself. And I just got recently got engaged and so at 50 and I'm going to be starting a family. Like I didn't even want children before I didn't, I didn't put a lot of stock into, into marriage and I didn't, I wasn't, I was not a good partner in my past relationships. It was all about me and my business and I was the star and, and my partner's wants were kind of like secondary, you know, I just didn't have a good mindset around all that. So in the past year, I think I'm just a way better human. I understand like, like what holds me back. I understand my old traumas and, and how it affected me, you know, growing up and, and, um, yeah, I'm just so happy and content compared to where I used to be that it's made all the difference in the world. Would you have done anything differently in building the business if you were to do it over? So I was a complete workaholic. And when in America, like, rewards workaholism. Mm -hmm. And it, it rewards yourself when you're seeing, like, revenue coming in. And so I just got so hooked into working that I was just always working. Even when I'd go and have fun, still checking my phone. I'd go on vacation, still working the whole time, 
just you know, going and seeing dolphins while I'm on my phone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I would do different. I'm very familiar. Yeah. I would do <laughs> different in that I would, a lot, of, I probably could have worked 60% of the time that I worked and had the same outcome. The other 40%, I was just doing stuff for work's sake. Tim Ferriss calls it in the four hour work week, working for work's sake. I just thought I always had to be grinding. Mm. And so I, if I was doing it again, I would delegate a lot of what I wasn't good at and not even try to do it. I would not do projects just to be doing projects. I would map out exactly what we should do strategically and I would follow that. And then at night I would put like a timer on my phone and that when that went off, I would just shut down. I would get the sleep I needed. I would work out. I would take care of myself. I would have been a better leader. I would have had, um, I think we would have had better results too. Yeah. So I said this before on, on different podcasts, but we, we had the same financial offer to, to buy the company four years into Biotrust as we ended up selling the company for. But they dropped out because once, once we got into diligence, we just didn't have everything you know, structured and everything the way we should have. So we had to put in another four or five years of work to have the same exit we could have had four years in had we known like, how to sell a company. Do you regret building the company the way you did? Um, I don't regret it because it's all like this amazing journey and I don't regret it at all. But if I were to have a, do, to do it again, I would just do it with just knowledge from when you're older, you know, you look back and things that are important to people 10 years ago aren't as important. I was like, I thought that if I made enough money, I would, I would have like a lot of self-esteem and feel great about myself. And I got that. Like Jim Carrey says, he said, everyone should make 10 million bucks or 20 million bucks or whatever. I think he said a hundred million. I think Jim Carrey, the actor said, everyone should make a hundred million dollars. And after a year later, you'll realize that it's not the answer to like, to living in your existence. Cause you can go buy the cars and the houses and the Rolexes and all that stuff. And then you're still just left with yourself and your relationships. So I, I kind of followed the same path and found the same thing out. I'm not, it's not like poor me. I sold a company for <laughs> nine figures and it's like, it's not that at all. I'm like so grateful for it. And it also gave me the life now where I can do this work. You know, I can, yeah. I can go journal on a beach for five hours in a day and, and figure stuff out. I can call friends that like our relationships have like waned over the years and, and reconnect with them. And I can spend time with my parents who are older. And before when I was running a company, I couldn't do it. I could have, but I didn't do any of that stuff. It was just all work, 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 company, 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 like all the time. What advice would you give somebody starting today? So let's say a 25 year old entrepreneur. Yeah. What's your advice as a 50 year old post exit person? And let me, let me preface this because the advice that you just gave, you know, that you heard that when you were younger. Yeah. I definitely heard it and it comes off as cliche mm. and out of touch yeah. and irrelevant to a young, hungry, ambitious entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah, yeah, money's not the answer. It's not about the money. <laughs> it's about who you become, you know? Well, the money is part of it because it allows you to do great things, like to help other people and, and charities and stuff. That's very true. But for a younger person, I think you got to go through it yourself, right? And you got to discover this yourself. And I also think 20s and 30s, you should go all in. You got so much energy. You need to screw up and learn things. You're not going to listen to anyone anyway. So you have to go through the, the process of, of your own journey, your own entrepreneurial journey. And you gotta, you gotta go through that. I'm just saying that along the way, I wouldn't lose yourself in it. And I, I would, I would, uh, spend time getting to know what drives you and, uh, who you are, you know, just don't let the company become your whole identity. I have friends that have sold big companies and then got divorced and are like just miserable. Mm. You know, it's like, it's, you got to keep the whole goal in mind of where you want to go but outside of just, just the money. And do you want a family? Do you want to get married? Do you want to, you know, all that stuff. So <clears throat> entrepreneurship becomes a uh, part of most people's identity when they're building, Yeah, you know, being a business person. Uh, my, my father makes stained glass lamps. And they're unbelievably ornate and beautiful. Yeah. Uh, he's a retired physician. That's awesome. It's crazy too. Like it's just this meticulous. It's the way that he unwinds, mm -hmm. and it's so meticulous. It seems like it seems <laughs> like it would be anxiety ridden. Yeah, I would be anxious. Oh my god! Um, but they take him hundreds of hours, 
and his he frequently uh, or on many occasions we've talked about sort of that not being economically viable yeah <laughs> there's no way to sell the lamp right yeah um and i currently at 43 have this thought in my head of um the economic viability of a hobby being part of the fun of the hobby uh but that's my stance now when i'm mm -hmm. in it do you at 50 post big exit have any desire to have business be a part of your life moving forward in any capacity and if so how will it be different than it was so i sold the company with joel two and a half years ago and after i sold um a lot of people told me like don't get into any more business like take a year off you've earned it you know fine you know i didn't do that right after i sold the company i immediately invested into another company was spending time on that because i was so wound up and in like just had to be doing something all the time that I started another company. And I was, I had a non-compete in supplements. And so that's my specialty. So then you go into an area that you're not a specialist at and it doesn't work, right? And then you invest in companies that you don't understand. And then a lot of them don't work. And, um, but anyway, I finally just slowed down probably a year after I sold the company. I'm just like, I'm just going to slow down. I'm going to look at my own stuff. I'm going to work on myself. I'm going to, my, myself is, I'm going to be my own company. Like I'm going to, you know, when they go in, they buy these companies that are like on the verge of bankruptcy and these, these VC companies, and then they put a new CEO and they rebuild the whole company. I basically looked at myself and said, I'm like a takeover project. Mm. And that's, I'm going to spend the next year and a half just looking at my tr nutrition supplements, how I sleep, get into biohacking, um, I'm really into anti-aging now, doing all these crazy things, trying to be healthy and live longer. And uh, yeah, I just, made my, I just made my own personal self, like my own company that I was <clears throat> taking over and reinventing. Yeah. Awesome. Um, anything else you want to tell people? Where do you want to point people? Do you care if people find out more about no, you? No, no. So after, you know, <laughs> after, you after I sold the company, I, I actually had like, and then I stopped working a little bit. I actually had a disdain for business. Yeah. It was like, I'm like, I don't want to like be selling and, and hawking another product like for the rest of my life. Like, I don't want the stress of HR and handling operations. And like, I can't believe I did that. It's probably like a pro athlete that like was doing the grind and working out every day and all this stuff for years. And then they ha they go through a crisis because they don't know who they are after they sell. And then after a while, then, then they kind of settle into their new life mm -hmm. and they look back on what they used to do. And they're like, I can't believe I even used to be able to do that. You know, that was insane. So now I invest, um, we have our own fund, Joel and I do, and we've mm. invested in 22 different companies. But the workload for me is like, I have some calls with founders when they, they need help with something, you know, once a week or something. And then I'm investing in um, lead investor in two pickleball courts. Mm. So we do one called Rush in um, Austin and it's on man check by all the bars out there. Okay. And so it's got 18 courts, half of them are covered. Some of them are going to be indoors, big bar, big restaurant, you know, that's going to be awesome. Cause I love playing pickleball and we got a community there and financially the projections look really good. Um, I invested in Maui. I have another home in Maui and they, we have a Aloha pickleball there that breaks ground later this year. Same concept, but with a gym, mm. you know, big state of the art gym and pickleball courts because there's so much tourism there, you know, those will do really well, yeah. but I have, there's people that have founded that I'm just like the lead investor. So I don't have to deal with, that's, what's great about after you sell a company, you can be involved in things. It's probably like being a grandparent and you don't have to raise the kids, <laughs> right? You just show up and play and do the fun stuff. And so now I'm in at that mode where I'm investing. I get to do calls when I want. I get to be in, as involved as I want. And, um, and financially, if, if I'm not an idiot and you just look at being in index funds and making an average of 10% a year, right? Like you don't have to, you don't have to make money again. Yeah. And so that's, it's a nice, it's a nice feeling to know that that's financially taken care of, but that that's what I'm doing now. I'm investing in pickleball courts. I'm working on myself, like on my own business and I'm, um, um, managing some investments and, you know, traveling, enjoying life, getting married, thinking about having a family. And, uh, yeah, it's completely, completely different now. I love it, man. Well, I appreciate you carving out time to come tell me about yeah, it, man. 
Yeah, awesome. It's, it's been great to get to know more than uh, uh, pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. More than pick There's so much more than pickleball. Out yeah, there. I don't know, man. I'm actually looking forward to the next pickleball adventure with you. So yeah, it'll be cool to check out the new club in town and hopefully someday in Maui. Yeah. All right, brother. Thanks again, man. Thanks for having me.